Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the fight picks for UFC Fight Night where Corey Overtime Anderson will be taking on Jan Blakovich in what will be an amazing light heavyweight matchup. This card is kind of low-key, pretty awesome. There's a lot of great fights on here, including Lando Venata taking on Yancey Medeiros and there's just a whole bunch of other ones. Let's get into them though. Here's the show. <laughs> All right, so before we get into the actual picks for the show, I want to address one question that just didn't quite make it in time for the retrospective to UFC 247, and I think it pertains a lot to the way that event took place. And so Kurt wrote us on Facebook here, just like you can. Go ahead and like the Facebook page, get in touch with me on Twitter at MMAFightPicks01, the email, FightingSpurPodcast at gmail.com. Loads of ways to get in touch with me, ask me questions anywhere that you like that you can get in touch with the show. Also, there is the Patreon as well that you can join if you'd like to support the show in any way. But let's get on to Kurt's question. So his question was, should the judges show their scorecards in between rounds and should there be MMA judges instead of boxing judges for these events? So Kurt, I actually want to, um, you know, take a little page out of Luke Thomas's playbook here. So Luke Thomas recently on his own show, he had mentioned how really nobody has the right answer for this. And I want to preface anything I'm about to say with that. Uh, if Luke Thomas doesn't know, if the best minds in MMA don't know, I'm not going to know either, but uh, I will give you my opinion on it. So should the judges show their scorecards in between rounds? <sighs> At first glance, I want to say yes, because I think that it will provide a lot more transparency and will make the judges a little more likely, I think, uh, to be aware of crowd reaction. Now, for things like that, that obviously then can play into things, not only the crowd reaction, but the fighter's reaction. Um, will it mean that uh, you know the judges will be more likely to give proper scores? Maybe. Will they feel under pressure if boos come in? Basically, once you bring the aspect of live scoring in, there's a lot of influence over everything that's going to take place. The fighters may react differently. They may not understand why they lost the round. It might throw them out of their headspace. Uh, they might go seeking a knockout if they know they're down two rounds. Um, and maybe in a fight that they think they're they're winning, so they could put themselves more at risk. There's a lot of things like that. And then the whole fan reaction thing, you know, not only to the score, but let's say there's a lot of clinch work. And even though, you know, clinch work sometimes can be a little boring, you know, I'm, I'm not going to defend it entirely, but it can be a little bit boring at times. And if the crowd's booing the clinch work, even though the fighter initiating the clinch is dominating, right? He's winning a little bit of hand fighting. Maybe he's getting a little dirty boxing in there, but they start booing. And all of a sudden the ref or not the ref, the judge believes that, okay, maybe the guy that's being clinched is actually winning this. And the other guy's just stalling and he's being influenced by the crowd. Um, so there's just a lot of things out there that I don't know what the right answer is for that one. Uh, it, it's just something I think that needs to be experimented with. And this, again, goes to Luke Thomas, you know, the bright MMA mind that he is. Uh, this goes to him. And if you have this live scoring system, it has to be experimented with in some place other than the UFC. I think the regional circuit is a great place to try this out, see what happens there, and then eventually try it in the UFC on a fight night Maybe, you know, similar to the one we're about to talk about. I don't think the place to debut a system like that is during a pay-per-view, during a title fight, something like that. But I think it is certainly worth being looked at. And then the second part of your question is, should there be MMA judges instead of boxing judges? So I think this also comes into the scoring system in a sense, too, because the scoring system is very much derived from boxing. And I think that, again, I'm going to go to the greater minds here. Dominic Cruz and Joe Rogan talked about this at the end of 247, and I actually agree with them a lot. It's about working together, both the UFC and the commissions, to get the right judges for the job. That could, you know, mean getting, you know, retired fighters that are well off, you know, people that wouldn't, um, you know, need external income, let's say, you know, because that's the reason the commission keeps these guys separate is because they're afraid of, you know, people paying them off, buying their their judging vote, right? So these guys are a little protected. I think if you take somebody who's financially well off, less likely to be influenced by outside factors um, that the UFC approves of, you know, maybe somebody 
uh, like a Forrest Griffin, I think comes to mind somebody who works for the UFC, which I understand now creates a, a level of bias and, and could be a potential problem. But he's fairly financially well off, from my understanding, and I think he's somebody that could do a really good job judging fights. Um, you know, I wouldn't want somebody who was just retired and, you know, didn't uh, have anything to do after fighting, you know, and, and maybe they they would be willing to take a little bit of money for things to go the other way. So uh, I think that judges just need to be agreed upon by both the commission and by the UFC to, you know, look at their records and, you know, agree or disagree if they made the right calls. You know, this judge, I'm not going to name his name. You can look him up. He's on Twitter. I'm not going to defame him here. But the judge uh, that called the Reyes card, 49-46, also uh, did the Dar- Jonathan Martinez fight and uh, Andre Wolf fight is at 30-27, which I understand was probably not correct. And then we also have the uh, James Krause fight that took place as well, where he, they gave it to Trevin Giles. He gave it to Trevin Giles, even though Krause had his back and put in submission attempts for the entire first round. That guy was a terrible judge. Uh, I don't know if it had anything to do with his background, but his understanding of the sport, I think, is not up to snuff compared to even your average casual MMA fan. I think that it was clear to see in those cases who was winning and who was losing. Uh, the John Jones Reyes fight, um, that that one I think is a little bit a little bit trickier to call because from you know the judge's perspective, uh, John was advancing, but I think to everybody that understands MMA a little bit or even boxing to an extent is that Reyes was fighting backwards to trap Jones. He was trying to lay traps for counters, and I don't know if he could see that. Uh, but the numbers kind of spoke for it because Jones was outstruck in the first three rounds, and so it was an effective style, even though he wasn't advancing. So I think that that effective style and additional strikes makes up for the fact that he wasn't moving forward. Um, you have to allow whatever your style is to win you the fight, and I think judges need to acknowledge that. So uh, kind of a long answer to your questions, but uh, I think they're definitely worth talking about, and I think the best thing that can be done is to experiment uh, with these things, you know, experiment with a commission working with the UFC to put in the best judges with the best records or histories of colony fights correctly. And, you know, trying out these new scoring systems on regional scenes and seeing, you know, how they play out and, and see how the fans, the fighters, and everybody else feels about that change. So those are my answers for those questions. Kurt, thank you for writing in. I appreciate it. And uh, now let's actually get into these fight picks. So let's start out with Jan Blakovich versus Corey Overtime Anderson. Okay, so in this main event, this light heavyweight contest, I believe that Corey Anderson is going to get it done against Blakovich. And the reason that I think that is because he is an explosive, dynamic striker. Is Blakovich more well-rounded? Yes, six KOs, nine submissions, he's 25 and eight. But look at the last loss that he has. Okay, it was against Tiago Santos, and that guy is extremely explosive. He had a hard time dealing with him even late into the third round where he was knocked out. He, in his most recent outings, has defeated Luke Rockhold and Jacare, but Jacare, not quite exactly what he used to be. He wasn't able to exploit his ground game like I think he wanted to. And Luke Rockhold was moving up to 205. And so I don't think that's the best, you know, test to have. Uh, and his, you know, previous wins, though, he had defeated Jared Cannonier and he had defeated Nikki and Nikita Krylov and Jimmy Manuel. All solid wins, but all a couple of years ago. And this is really around the time that I think. Corey Anderson basically started coming into his own. He had wins over Johnny Walker, Ilar Latifi, Glover Teixeira, and Patrick Cummings. All really solid fighters. In fact, both guys have really solid wins out there. But the way Corey Anderson shut down the hype train against Johnny Walker and defeated very solid, durable guys like Latifi and Teixeira, I think that this is a new version of Anderson. You know, he's not the guy that got knocked out by Manawa or by Ovin St. Peru. I think he's improved his game. It's been three years since those losses. And I think that he is going to try to make a statement here and climb the ranks to get a shot against John Jones. Jan Blakovich kind of made a point of that by defeating Jacare and Luke Rockhold. I think that he's kind of in the up and runners to take on Jones, but I think Corey Anderson's going to steal it from him, and I think it's really going to be that one-touch KO power. He doesn't have to TKO you. He doesn't have to ground and pound you. He can put your lights out with one well-precisely placed shot, and I think that he can do that against Blakovich. I am picking Corey Anderson 
overtime in this matchup. Moving on to the co-main, we're going to have Diego the Nightmare Sanchez taking on Michael Pereira in what will be a very interesting welterweight contest. Interesting because Diego Sanchez is the last guy left standing from the original Ultimate Fighter. He's a legend, he's a pioneer in a lot of ways, um, but I don't think that he should honestly still be competing at this point uh, in his career. Did he have wins over Mickey Gall and Craig White recently? Yeah, but, but I really think that those were, you know, the last wins on his way out. I don't know why he fought Chiesa in his last outing, um, and I don't think he's going to be able to defeat Michael Pereira. Pereira, you know, he's not a guy that can weather a storm necessarily. We saw this against Tristan Connolly, but he is a guy that is extremely explosive. And if you got maybe a little bit of a chin, like I think Diego Sanchez has to have, I think Michael Pereira is going to be able to catch you with one of those crazy flying knees. He's going to be able to catch you with a really solid right hand. I think that he's going to be able to shut the lights out of Diego Sanchez. However, with that being said, here's the grain of salt. If this thing does end up going the way that Tristan Connolly was able to defeat Pereira by you know draining the gas tank and taking the highlight reel out of the out of the program I think that Sanchez has the experience the fight IQ to grind it out but Sanchez loves to brawl he does have a kind of short fuse and I think if Pereira wants to throw down Sanchez is going to be more than happy or be obliged to participate in an exchange which is where Pereira, I think, picks up the win here. Uh, Pereira looked, you know, really good coming into the UFC with his win over Daniel Roberts. He was on a hot streak uh, on his way in as well out of his Road FC promotion. I think that he gets back to the, you know, way he was, the highlight real action, and I think he scores an amazing KO victory over Diego Sanchez in probably the first round. That's how I see it playing out, and he is my pick in the co-main. All right, in our next contest here, we're going to have Devin Clark versus Daquan Townsend. So this fight was recently changed. Uh, instead of Daquan Townsend, we were supposed to have, I believe, Antikolov. I can't think of his uh, first name. And I had Antikolov winning this one, but ever since we had to switch it to the late replacement on about a week's notice, uh, I'm going with Devin Clark on this one. Devin Clark, I think, is a much better fighter than Daquan Townsend. Townsend's not looking too great lately. Uh, he took a fight in June of 2019 and then January 25th, 2020. Lost both outings, one against Dalcha Lambagula, one, one against Bevin Lewis, and I don't think he's going to be able to win against Devin Clark. I'm sure he wants to bounce back. I'm sure that he wants to pick up a victory to you know, kind of actually make a statement in the UFC. Um, maybe he's trying to get in their good graces in case he does take an L uh, and has a, maybe another chance. Uh, but I see him on the verge of getting bounced here, and I think Devin Clark's going to be more than happy to throw him out of the UFC. He's a Jackson Wink product. He's 31 years of age. He looks very dynamic. Granted, he did get caught with that guillotine against Ryan Spann, but I thought he looked good otherwise uh, against fighters like Darko Stoisic and Mike Quick Rodriguez. He has lost to some of the best in the biz, though, like Blakovic and Rakic. Um, I just... Townsend versus Rakic or Blakovich is just not at that level. I think Derek Clark, uh, Devin Clark, isn't quite maybe at the elite level yet. Not to say he couldn't be, uh, but I don't think that Townsend's going to really, you know, give him any kind of trouble in this outing. I think that he's going to walk right through him. Granted, you know, Townsend still throws a heavy hand. He could still catch him. That's always a factor in MMA. But I think that Devin Clark's just the much, much better fighter here. So I got to go with Devin Clark, the brown bear, in this light heavyweight matchup. All right, and our next one here at Ladies Flyweight. We're going to have Montana De La Rosa take on Mara Barella. And so this is, looks like a pretty good fight, I got to say. Um, both these fighters are coming off of losses here. They're actually coming off of losses to what we uh, to the fighters we just saw at UFC 247, uh, which I thought was a bad call, but let's not get into that part of things. But uh, De La Rosa recently lost to Andrea Lee, and uh, Barella uh, recently lost to Lauren Murphy. So... It's kind of weird, you know, <laughs> both these fighters could have met differently at 247, it seems like, if they had picked up wins here, uh, but they obviously uh, weren't able to get that done. In this contest, though, I think that De La Rosa is a little bit better fighter here. I really love her submission game, and even though Barella does train over an American top team, I don't think she's showcased the best 
ground game. I don't think she's showcased the best takedown defense, and I think that De La Rosa is going to be able to exploit that. Barilla is pretty well-rounded. She has decent hands. She's okay on the ground, but I think that the specialist that De La Rosa is with her submission game, picking up arm bars, rear naked chokes. Uh, in fact, those are her last four wins, really, uh, besides the Andrew Lee loss. Nadia Kasem arm bar, Reese Lashevich rear naked choke, Christina Marks arm bar, and uh, Katarina, or yeah, Katina Lowe with a submission as an arm bar. So uh, that low fight was outside of the UFC, but she had three straight submission victories heading into a contest against a- Andrea Lee. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to get it done there, but I think she will be able to do it against the less well rounded fighter. I-, I think we can all agree Andrea Lee is probably better than Burrell, even though she lost in her last outing, which was, I think, kind of a travesty. Not to talk about 247, but it was a travesty to Andrea Lee lost. All right, maybe not a travesty. It was just a bad call. Either way, uh, I am going with De La Rosa here. I think she's going to take the back, get an arm bar. She's going to work her game, put it on the mat, and get it done. I am picking Montana De La Rosa in this contest. In the next fight taking place at lightweight, we are going to have Yancey Medeiros coming down from his normal welterweight, taking on Lando Venata in what should be a really good contest. In fact, this is the fight that I'm most excited for because I really like watching Lando Venata fight. I think that he is a very fun fighter uh, that's run into a lot of bad luck recently, and I'm really hoping that he can break his kind of streak of bad luck. Uh, So he had a win in 2019 against Marcos Mariano, but... He had a draw to Frivola, a draw to Bobby Green, lost to Dracar Close, Ross, a loss to Mark DeCasey, and uh, then a loss to also David Taymor. These aren't in chronological order here. And his last uh, win before the Marcos Mariano fight was back in 2016 against John McDessey. This guy has been all over the place with just a lot of bad luck, and I don't think his record in these contests show what kind of competitor he is. You know, we look at that Tony Ferguson fight, look at how he brought it to Ferguson, and I'm hoping... I don't know if I'm quite praying, but I'm hoping that he can bring that fire and that energy to take on Yancey Medeiros. Medeiros, excellent fighter himself, has lost to two amazing competitors in his last two outings, Gillespie and Cerrone. He also, in his last uh, solid win, was against Alex Oliveira, and that is a very hard thing to accomplish. But he has struggled with great strikers with a little bit of ground game or wrestlers in Gillespie and Cerrone. And I'm not saying that Venata is quite on their level, but he's finally 27 years of age. He's matured. He does have five submissions over his uh, 10 wins and four four knockouts over his 10 wins. I think he, he poses enough of a dynamic threat against Yancy Medeiros that he's going to be able to if not shut the door, get a victory here. But for Venata, I really want to see him shut the door. I think he needs a stoppage. I think his fight IQ is there. He just hasn't been able to get it done. And I really, really want to see this thing taken out of the judges' hands and get a decisive victory against an excellent opponent in Yancey Medeiros. I think this is a guy Venata can beat. I think that he has the skills to pay the bills. And I am going to take Lando Venata in this contest. In our next one here at the very dangerous division of Bantamweight, we have John Dodson taking on Nathaniel Wood, the prospect. And this is going to be a great fight. We've seen John Dodson be one of the best in the biz at flyweight back in the day. He's now a little more advanced age at 35, but still training at Jackson Wink and is still a good competitor, still has some speed, still has some power, but I think he's a little too small and I think he's not going to be able to get it done against Nathaniel Wood. Dental Wood is a hot product right now. This guy hasn't had a loss since he was outside of the UFC back in 2016. He's been putting it on guys, KOs, TKOs, submissions, uh, Bravo choke, two rear naked chokes against Kionis and Andre Uhl. This guy knows how to shut the door. His his fight IQ is through the roof, and I think that he's going to be able to do it against a guy who doesn't always shut the door in Dodson. He has nine decisions over his 20 wins. He does have nine KOs, but those haven't come in quite a while. His last TKO was back in 2016, and I honestly don't think he's going to pose much of a threat here to Nathaniel Wood as
as far as shutting it out. I think if it does go to decision, we got to side a little bit with the age and experience of Dodson. You know, he has the speed to stay away. He has the speed to get in and score points and then exit before Nathaniel Wood hits him with something big. But I think that Wood has the skills. I think even though he has about half the fights, I think he has enough experience at this point. He's 16-3, and hasn't come had a loss in so long. His confidence is high. I got to go with Wood in this one. He is my pick in this contest. All right, we have the great Jim A10 Miller taking on Scott Holtzman in our next contest. This one is going to be taking place at lightweight, and it's a really, really good fight. And I would love to say that Jim Miller, I think, is going to get a win here, but I got to give it to Holtzman. Uh, Jim Miller just, uh, you know, he he's had so many losses recently. I know he's avenged a lot of them with guys like Clay Guida, Jace Gonzalez, but he's lost to Hooker, Trinaldo, Pettis, Poirier, Charles. I, I, he's just had so many losses as of late. I don't know where his health is either. I believe he does suffer from Lyme disease, supposedly. Uh, when I listened to Joe Rogan's last podcast, he has it under control, and so I am hoping he wins. You know, this is definitely a taken and grain of salt situation. But I think Holtzman is a good fighter. I think that his loss to Nick Lentz, you know, is just kind of a fluke. And I think he really should be undefeated at this point. I think he just didn't show up. His win over Dung Young Ma was amazing. His win against Daryl Horcher uh, was really good. And when he KO'd uh, Alan Patrick uh, Alves, it, he just looked phenomenal back at UFC 229. I like Holtzman right now. I like hot sauce. I think that he's got the fire in the belly to keep it going. I think that he can shut down a pioneer and legend like Miller. But let's keep in the back of our mind that we know that Miller's his submission game is so tight that if he can get a hold of Holtzman, he can choke his life out. Holtzman, you know, he's got more decisions than he has, you know, KOs or submissions. Uh, in fact, he almost has doesn't have as many combined, right? He's got seven KO, uh, sorry, five KOs, two submissions, and then six decisions for his 13 wins. Um, so his fight IQ, I don't think quite as high as Miller's, uh, and he just doesn't have the experience either. Miller's 31 and 13. I mean, this guy's been fighting since forever, even though they're the same age, Holtzman got into this game a little bit later in life. So if it does turn into a grappling affair, I got to go back over to Jim Miller as long as he has that gas tank, even though he does suffer from Lyme disease, I think that he could potentially get it done. It's just, I got to side with the numbers. The numbers say Holtzman, just take it with a grain of salt here because I can see many pathways to victory for Miller to get it done. Uh, It's just, again, I'm going with the numbers. I'm picking hot sauce, Scott Holtzman to pick up a W. All right, getting back to guys that have challenged at flyweight before. We're going to have Ray Borg take on Rogerio Bontornin, and this is going to be another flyweight contest. So we've seen Borg jump around. He did fight Benjamin for a little while. He's back at flyweight. Bontornin is also at flyweight, and I think that Bontornin is the better pick here. Uh, both of these guys, great at submissions. Um, they have a little bit of power in their hands. We have Bontornin with just the three KOs over 60 wins, and then Borg just picking up the one. Um, but I do like Bontornin here. I think that he's getting it done better. We have a lot of decisions out of Borg. Uh, Borg hasn't actually shut the door on anyone uh, since back in 2015. Whereas if I look over at Bontornin, yes, it was a cut stop. It's against Rulon Paiva, but still he shut it down. Uh, he got a rear naked choke against uh, Gustavo Gabriel to get into the UFC. And he did have a split decision against Magomed Budalov uh, back uh, in February of 2019, about a year ago. Uh, but I think that he has the fight IQ. I think that he has the ability. And I think that he can be somebody to challenge, you know, Figueredo or Benavides, probably going to be Benavides, when the belt is taken. I think that that's what we're setting up here for. I think that Bontornin is is that kind of guy, and I think he's going to make a statement against a guy that also challenged for that flyweight title back when Demetrius Johnson held it in Ray Borg. And I think, I don't know if it's going to play out quite as one-sided as when Ray Borg took on Mighty Mouse, but I see Von Tornin getting the edge here. I think he's going to outdo him on the ground. I think he's going to outdo him on the feet. I think he's a superior fighter. I'm going Rogerio Von Tornin in this flyweight matchup. Our next one here is going to be another very dangerous bantamweight matchup because we have Casey Kenny taking on Mario Davalavici. And so in this one, I got to go with Davalavici. I think that his ability to score takedowns is going to be way too much for Casey Kenny. This guy's output statistics for takedown are kind of ridiculous. Let me pull them up here real quick. So when I look down here, we got 6.75 takedowns on average for every 15 minutes. This guy is putting you on the mat again and again. He's scoring points, he's scoring takedowns, and he's dominating control. 
Granted, he only has two knockouts and one submission over his nine wins, but he's putting himself in really good areas to pick up wins. And so even though I think that Casey Kenny is the more aggressive fighter here, I think that he's going to be snuffed out by Davali Vichy's takedowns. I think that he's going to end up sapping the gas tank if he gets him down, and I think he's going to raw Kenny of his aggression and really just take it all away from him. I like Davali Vichy in this one. I think he's going to pick up a W in this bantamweight matchup. All right, and our last one at Flyweight here before we get into the debuting bouts. We're going to have Mark De La Rosa, the Bumblebee, take on Rulon Paiva. And so Paiva, he did get that cut. It was kind of a, a robbery stoppage in a lot of ways, you know, but hey, cuts happen. It was nasty. The doctor stepped in and called it back in August of 2010 against Bontornan, who we talked about earlier. Uh, and in this one, though, I think he's going to be able to avenge that loss here. I think that he's going to be able to beat a guy in Mark De La Rosa who hasn't looked too great recently. Uh, granted, you know, Paiva hasn't looked great either with two losses, but I think that loss to Bartone was a little bit of a fluke because that doctor stoppage, I mean, that fight really could have gone either way and it kind of derailed Bontorne, I think, from picking up potential W. So um, when I look at the guys, I think that Pipe is just a slightly more well-rounded fighter, and I think that he ultimately will get it done. I am going to go ahead and pick Rulon Paiva in this matchup. To go over the other fighters that are having some debut bouts, we're going to have Tim Means take on Danielle Rodriguez. Uh, in this one, uh, I got to go with Means in this one. Rodriguez, you know, he's looking like a pretty hot product coming into the UFC. Um, he did get a decision uh, in his Dana White Contender Series bout. He got a TKO in his next contest outside of the UFC, and now he's finally being called back to have a go at it. But the Dirty Bird, you know, takes no prisoners. He will put you away, and I think that Means is going to be able to do that and prove that he still belongs in the UFC, even though he's getting up there in age. I mean, his last win over Tiago Alves was really good. Alves is no joke, and I think he's going to be able to derail uh, Rodriguez here. Rodriguez not super young fighter he's 33 years of age uh, and I don't think he's going to be able to uh, get it done he didn't make it into UFC on his first attempt in I don't think he's going to stay long either I think the dirty bird gets it done I am going with Tim Means in that contest in the next one we're going to have uh, let's see here Brock Weaver take on Rodrigo Vargas and in this one I think that Vargas gets it done here I think that he's a slightly better talent uh, Brock Weaver came off a solid win in Dan White Tennis Series got a unanimous victory uh, but we've seen Vargas in the UFC and uh, he's performed in the lights Granted, he did get a loss but I think he wants to prove that he's going to be here going to be able to get it done and like I said it is a debuter so take it very much with a grain of salt but I like Vargas in this one uh, even though he did have a loss in his first entry, I think he's going to come back. Um, I still like his style, and I, I think that he's able to get it done uh, in his first real UFC or UFC victory. And then we got to look uh, at the late replacement, Macy Kiesen, uh taking on Shana Young. So uh, this fight was supposed to be, I believe, Nico Montano. That was going to be a pretty fun one. Uh, but instead, we are left with Macy Kiesen versus Shana Young. So Shana Young is making her UFC debut. She... Uh, Lost in the Dana White Contender Series, went back to Invicta, picked up a W, uh, but I don't think that she's going to pose much of a problem here for Kiesen. I think Kiesen, uh, who looked like a steamroller coming into her fight against Landsberg, has learned a lesson about respecting your opponents and understanding uh, that you can't just roll through everyone because Lena was able to drop some nasty elbows on her and pick up a win. I think she's learned from her mistakes, and I think she's back. I think she's going to go 6-1. and one. I see her shutting the door on Shane Young, who's this late replacement. So let's go over them one more time. We have Anderson, Pereira, Clark, De La Rosa, Venata, Wood, Holtzman, Bontornin, Devashivili, Paiva, Means, Vargas, and Kiesen to round things out. All right, so I already went over the housekeeping pretty much at the start of the show, so that's already out of the way. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for liking and subscribing and everything else at this point. I'm going to be back with the retrospective coming this weekend. Uh, looking ahead, though, things are still you know rolling pretty nicely for us here. Uh, we got the Felder-Hooker fight on the 22nd. That's also going to be uh, the Tyson Fury versus Deontay Wilder fight, uh, the sequel 
to uh, decide, I think, who's ultimately going to fight Joshua. Uh, so that one is taking place on the 22nd. Not that I'm crunching fights on that at all, but I think it's a good thing to know. Uh, then the week after that, we got Benavides versus Figueroa for that vacated flyweight championship. Not the best card in the world, in my personal opinion, but uh, excellent one. Uh, and, you know, Felder Hooker is, is way up there. I just want to throw it out there. That's going to be an Auckland, New Zealand card, though. So like I said, the Wilder Fury fight is taking place that day. I have to imagine this Auckland, New Zealand card is going to take place in a time frame. Uh, that'll make sense so people can watch both. And then uh, going into the next paper, I won't go beyond that. We have Adesanya Romero, March 7th. That one is looking phenomenal. It's not the craziest stacked car, but I think everybody really wants to see it. We got Zhang and Joan Jacek. Um, I believe that uh, we're going to put Jared Cannon here versus Darren Till in that one. That's not finalized because Whitaker will be out. Uh, let's see what else. Neil Magny coming in against Jean Lang G or Lee. Uh, Alex Oliveira, Max Griffin, solid fight on that one. Derek Brunson, Shabazi, and oh, there's some there's some great ones on here. And uh, this one, I think, was flying a little under the radar. We got Mark Madsen in there, the Olympian, the guy I picked against accidentally not realizing he was an Olympian. Uh, that guy is a steamroller, and he is going to make a statement at lightweight when he takes on Austin Hubbard. So uh, that's getting ahead. That's like almost a month out or a little under a month out at this point. Uh Let's, uh, you know, bring it back in. We're going to go back to the retrospective uh, this weekend with Anderson and Blakovich, and we'll just carry on through and through. we got a great month here. We don't have any layoffs for quite a while, uh, so I'm just uh, really excited, and we'll just keep rocking and rolling. So until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.